We're looking at the four stages of spiritual maturity. 1 John 2, verses 12 to 14. I'll read those verses again. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you're strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you've overcome the evil one. So we're looking at the four stages of spiritual maturity. Little children, children, young men, fathers. You'll see that every stage is covered. Everyone is covered in what John shares with us here. And you'll see that you can separate this passage into two sections, and each section follows the same sequence. Children, fathers, young men. Children, fathers, young men. Why does John repeat this sequence? Well, because it's important. And when you repeat something, you do it because it's important. It's also a good teaching technique. If you repeat things in different ways, they sink in a lot more readily. Think about that sequence for a moment. Children, fathers, young men. It seems out of order, doesn't it? You would think it should be children, young men, fathers, but it's not. Children, fathers, young men. Why are the fathers in the center of the sequence? Because both children and young men need fathers. If you're at the stage of spiritual maturity where you could say, I'm a father, then the children in the Lord and the young men in the Lord both need you. We don't need fathers just at the beginning of our life or of our walk. We need them all the time. Now you may be asking, where are the women in this passage? Where's the female gender? Well, you've got them there You have the female gender there in the first two stages, little children and then children. Includes both male and female. But after that, John writes exclusively to males, young men and fathers. This word in the Greek is masculine. It's not one of the words that can be applied to both genders. So there's got to be a reason why John is doing this and using masculine nouns when we get to the stage of young men and fathers. Here's why. Because when when we've grown and we're no longer spiritual children, men, it is your responsibility, men, males, to set the tone for the whole church, for both the men and the women. Men, young men, fathers, It is your responsibility to set the atmosphere, to set the tone for the whole church, males and females, to be that example, to defend, to provide, to lead, to teach, the same as in marriage. Men, it's your responsibility to set the atmosphere and set the tone. Does that make sense? I'm going to leave that there with you. Let's look at the four stages of spiritual maturity. We're going to actually look at them in order of the stages rather than in order of the verses here to make it a bit simpler to follow. So he starts with little children. Little children. And what does he say? Your sins are forgiven. He says, I'm writing to you to let you know, to tell you, to remind you that your sins are forgiven. Your sins are permanently removed. All of them. This is the most basic truth. And it's the most important thing to believe, is it not? Your sins are forgiven. Permanently removed. All of them. I'll illustrate this with a conversation I had this week with a man who came to see me in Oswestry. Street. I'd not met him before. I would put him in his early to mid-60s. Big, strong man. First thing he said to me was, I've been fighting the devil for 40 years. And I said, have you won? 
And he said, no. And I said, do you want to know what the key is to defeating the devil? The key. He said, tell me. I was sat in front of a big cross. I said, that is the key. Your sins are forgiven because Jesus died for you. That's the key. You stand on that ground, you'll beat the devil every time. He went on to tell me that he'd been in the military and he said to me, I'm not savable. I'm not savable. I said, why? I said, because of the things that I've done and had to do. I said to him, well, number one, there's a battle going on between light and dark and sometimes actions have to be taken in the world, in the physical world, to to defeat the darkness. So just the simple fact of having to do the things you've done doesn't mean that you're not savable or that you've done anything wrong. That's not what I want to focus on this morning. I want to focus on this. He said, I'm not savable. I said, well, you already are. It's already done. There's the cross. He left that conversation a changed man. A changed man. Because he realized, my sins are forgiven. And therefore I'm saved. And I dare say the devil has taken a hike from his life. He says to the little children, your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. What does that mean? It means to demonstrate who God is. Forgiving sins, that's who God is. God so loved the world that he gave Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins. Your sins are forgiven because God wants to, is another way of saying that. Little children, in the faith, that's the most important thing to believe. And it remains the most important thing to believe for all of us for the whole of our life and will do into eternity, which is why in the book of Revelation, when heaven is described It's the lamb that we see on the throne all the way through, reminding us your sins are forgiven. That's why you're here. So on he goes to the next stage of spiritual maturity. Children. So not little children anymore, children. And by the way, I imagine as I'm speaking, you'll be placing yourself somewhere on this scale of spiritual maturity. Are you a little child in the Lord? Some of you are. Are you a child in the Lord? Some of you are. Are you a young man in the Lord or are you at the stage where, as a woman, you're learning from the young men in the Lord and receiving an example and and blessing from that? Or are you a father in the Lord? And or equally, are you a woman who is at the stage in her walk where she's able to receive from and engage with that which the fathers are walking in in the Lord? You're somewhere in that picture this morning. And maybe you're already thinking, well, which, where am I? So he goes on from little children to children. And he says, I'm writing to you children because you know the father. Who do you know? The father. That's God. God, the father. The father who is involved, who didn't just give you life and walk off. The father who's involved and remains involved. The Father who generously gives you life in all ways. The God who daily builds you up. That's the Father. That's who you know. And you know him in a certain way. There are two words used in Greek or in 1 John for the word know. And the one he uses here is ginosteo, which means an active, ongoing relationship. That is a blessing to both parties and which grows stronger and stronger. So he's saying, children, you know the Father, you know this God who generously gives you life daily. You know him in an active two-way relationship that blesses both him and you and grows stronger and stronger. He's saying that's, that's how you know the Father. That's the kind of way you know him. Then he goes on, young men. Young men, I'm writing to you, he says, because you've overcome the evil one. Now, 1 John is a letter of contrasts, light and dark, love and hate, God and Satan. And so when he says you've overcome the evil one, he's meaning you've overcome Satan. 
and all his demons and dark shadows, you've overcome them. You've overcome the opposite of the father, right? You know the father, you've known the father since you were a child in the Lord, and now you've overcome the evil one. The one who comes to steal instead of give. The one who comes to kill instead of give life. The one who comes to destroy instead of edify. You've overcome him. Notice he says you have overcome Satan, the evil one. As we know from Colossians 2.15, on the cross, Jesus Christ triumphed over all the demonic principalities and powers and made an open public shame of them. The job's done. You have the victory. We have the victory already. You just step into it. That's how it works. You have overcome the evil one. The victory is yours. You just step into it. Now, you have to choose to step into it. You have to choose to. But knowing that you've already won, why not step into it? Why not enter the fray? What's the name of the guy that wrote The Art of War? Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu, The Art of War. An ancient book that's been read by many uh, kings and uh, military leaders over the millennia. And he says that you should not enter into a battle unless you know that you're going to win. Don't enter a conflict unless you know that you are going to win. Well, we know that we're going to win over the devil because Jesus already has won. So we've got no reason not to enter that conflict and win. So he says, I'm writing to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. So you've overcome him positionally. You're in Jesus and he won the victory. You are called to overcome him volitionally, to choose to step into that battle. And I dare say, young men in the room and listening, that you've overcome him in some ways experientially that you've already done it before. There are ways that you've overcome the devil before in your life. So do it again and again and again and again. And as we do it more and more, we become more adept at warfare, more easily overcoming the enemy. At times, you may find that you're sending the devil flying without even knowing it because it's become and you're becoming an expert in war, spiritual war. Song of Solomon talks about the mighty men of Solomon, and they're all wearing swords, it says, and they're all expert in war. So, young men, you've overcome the evil one already in Christ. You overcome him every time you step into the battle on that victory, the ground of that victory, and you've overcome him experientially in the past, so keep doing it, and you become expert in war. And the key to it all, young men, the key in overcoming the evil one, the key in, in the battle, is that the battle is the Lord's. Jesus has already won the victory. That's, that's the key. Always. The battle is the Lord's. So, positionally, experientially, volitionally, young men, you've overcome the evil one. So keep overcoming the evil one. He then goes into a bit more detail, young men, about how this happens. He says, you're strong and the word of God abides in you. So young men, you're strong in the Lord and the word of God abides, lives, is breathing, living, growing in you. That's how you overcome. That's why you overcome. The mighty men of Solomon, they're all wearing swords. What does that represent? The word of God, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And you're strong in the spirit of God. So that's young men. Next stage, fathers. He says, I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who's from the beginning. He actually repeats himself. He speaks to the fathers twice and he says the same thing, exactly the same thing both times. Because I guess he's got to the point where there's not much more to say. He says, you've known him who's from the beginning. Who is he who is from the beginning? Well, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all from the beginning. Don't be make the slight, subtle, but important mistake of thinking he means just the Father. 
when he says you've known him who's from the beginning. Because the Lord, Jesus, has been there from the beginning. Not a created being, as the Jehovah's Witnesses would have it. He is God. And the Holy Spirit is God. So fathers, you've known the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And you've known them, it's the same word here, in a ginosteo relationship, an active, two-way, growing relationship that is a blessing to everyone involved and gets stronger and stronger. He's saying, fathers, this is the kind of relationship that you have with God. And there's a bigness to this, isn't there? There's a grandeur to it. There's also a granular detail to this kind of relationship with God. You've got a sense of the whole. The best way I could think to phrase this, to know him as who's from the beginning, is you're connected into the full glory of God. We spoke earlier, John 3.34, that God gives the spirit without measure. He's saying, fathers, you, you're, you're living that. You're connected into the full glory of God. The spirit is moving in you, through you, without measure. Beautiful. And when he says this, that you know him who's from the beginning, fathers, he's speaking again, positionally, experientially, and volitionally. Positionally, you know him who's from the beginning. You are in that relationship. That's a fact. Volitionally, you're in that relationship because you're choosing day by day to walk in the Lord. And experientially, you're in that relationship because you're just experiencing this grandeur, this bigness and this detail every day. Maybe you're on that stage of spiritual maturity. So praise God, the four stages of spiritual maturity. Little children, your sins are forgiven because he wants to. Children, you know the Father. You're in an active two-way relationship with the one who gives you life every day. Young men, you've overcome the evil one. You've got the victory already. Just keep stepping into it. Fathers, you know him who's from the beginning. You're connected into the full glory of God. And guess what? No matter what stage you're in, little children, children, young men, fathers, it's not all about you. We have these things in God. Yes, to bless us ourselves, but also to bless others. So if you're a little child in God, if all you know is my sins are forgiven and that's what you're clinging to, that's a blessing for you, but also it's going to bless other people when they see you believing that for yourself and when they hear you saying to them, do you realize your sins are forgiven? Jesus died on the cross for you. And the same applies to all the other stages. Whatever you have in God, it's for, it's for others as well. And you've got to know others are being blessed by the stage that you're in. Finally, there's something very, very powerful about speaking the word of God. Remember, we are body and soul. And every detail of our body and soul matters to God as much as the rest. Body and soul. It's all for the glory of God. So taking that initiative and saying, Lord, I'm going to speak the truth. Very powerful because it's engaging body and soul in glorifying the Lord. So that's what we're going to do. So we all can say, my sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Let's say it. My sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Now look at the person next to you and say to them, your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Yes. I'm confused, Peter. Why? You've been through young men and a grandfather. <laughs> yeah, it's because we're talking spiritually, not, yeah. not physically. Yeah. yeah. So, um, young men, let's say it together. I have overcome the evil one. I have overcome the evil one. I am strong. And the word of God abides in me. Okay. And then fathers, you know, hopefully you've been including yourself in all the other bits because 
you don't lose one bit when you get to the next. Fathers, I know him who's from the beginning. Fathers and women connected to that. I know him who's from the beginning. Okay, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your great sacrifice on the cross and your position as King of kings and Lord of lords from which you pour out to us your Holy Spirit, Lord. And we know that you have the Spirit of God to give to us without measure. We thank you, Lord. We do thank you, Father. Lord, Father God, we thank you that our sins are forgiven for your name's sake. We thank you, Lord, that we know you who's from the beginning. We thank you that we've overcome the evil one, that we're strong, the word of God abides in us, and we've overcome the evil one. We thank you, Lord, that we know him who's from the beginning. We worship and bless you, Lord, and pray for your wider church, Lord, for an increased understanding and experience, Lord, of all these powerful realities. Again, Lord, we pray, open our eyes that we may see. In Jesus' name, amen.